We're going to move into a slightly different mode. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce you to or talk about uh, a, a new measure that uh, is now uh, available in publicly released data. I'll tell you about it. And I'm hoping to um, have assistance from our community here um, in finding good ways to put together constructs and think to use these data and to help us to move along in terms of thinking about mixed feelings and more, or as is called in some quarters, the experience of well-being uh, rather than evaluated or evaluations of life satisfaction. So talking about, um, and we're, we're putting uh, our evaluations in the context of activities that people are doing um, within their routine day. Uh, and I'm, as I'm starting to think about this, is, and like James, this is sort of a, an initial run through, so you know, we're still f figuring out exactly how to describe this. I did talk about it very differently in different contexts to different audiences. Um, but I'm starting to think about a sort of, uh, in survey world, you talk about a telescope or new windows on, into the lives and the well-being of older adults. Um, so let's move along. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge, um, of course, the very generous support of NIA. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about data from the Health and Retirement Study. These are the publicly available data. Um, I'll tell you where to download it. Uh, and a wonderful team of people, some who've already moved off to bigger and better places, moving up in their career, but there's a solid core. And, um, and here today, I think we have uh, Richard, of course, Rich, Lindsay at the back, uh, Hannah Geisen, and uh, uh, maybe that's all right now. <laughs> um, Shannon was here yesterday. Okay. So this is uh, something that, um, who mentioned this yesterday? I think Vicky did. Uh, this is the data, well, one set of data, it's a very widely reported data that life gets better as you get older. And there's something about being middle-aged middle or being around uh, this age, oh, whoops, uh, oh, sorry, I'm giving the game away here, um, being around age 50 that, um, <coughs> I'm used to my own, um, that um, is, there's something going on there. However, this doesn't really tell us the whole story. So I've been raised in a tradition where you think about individual differences. So this is the average. Um, however, there's a lot of variation around that average trajectory. Um, and uh, so if we, these are data from HRS, this is uh, not the same measure that uh, they use, but at least the, the one in the middle, if I could figure out, oh, there it is, uh, satisfied with life uh, is one variety. And here I've got, we, we don't have the younger, but we do have 50 onwards, and we actually do have, in this sample, many people over the age of 90. Um, we still do in this data set. Uh, HRS, so anyone could go in and analyze it yourself. But I, I'd like to point out, so here we have the trajectory. There's, so there's something, yes, an increase maybe up to about age 70, but something's going on at after the 70s. And there's quite a lot of variation around the 50s, and maybe a little less in the middle, but you know that's hard to say, so people have to um, analyze that themselves. And then if we take each adjective, this is on the panis or the panis x, x sorry, um, different words. If you look at each one, there's a slightly different um, age trend plot and a lot more variation on some items than others. Um, and I, so I think it's very important to realize that you know a single line is only not really representing the complexity um, that one might see uh, in, in uh, a larger sample. But, uh, and just to point out, it's always nice to see some pictures at this time of the day. So midlife, okay, so midlife might be a difficult time. Um, so what's going on there? Well, there are a lot of different things and that's, you're going to find 
subgroups of people who are facing many different issues and in a large representative sample the heterogeneity is very important and knowing much more about what's driving um, their evaluation of their life. So here you see some examples currently of course we're seeing a lot of people who are being made redundant after the age of 50 and that makes life pretty difficult, right? And there are others who are more worried about um, staying fit but finding well that might get a little more difficult also after the age of 50 especially if you've neglected it for a while um, but then there's, there's also a huge amount of variation uh, after the age of 90 and so here I just selected some um, photos from a report in, in um, 2010 um, so of course we see the very vital oldest old and here are some, except these are real life people from the US. <laughs> um, we have some of these sorts of people also uh, in the health and retirement study. But there are also many who are suffering and, and their lives are not necessarily um, in the best state. And in particular, that is the truth for many older women. Um, and many older uh, people actually do live by themselves. So there's, it, the social environment also changes a lot. So um, with my colleagues from Berlin, including Neil Emran, who's at the back, so it's nice to have all these young people who can do all these fancy analyses. But these are data from um, the Berlin Aging Study and where we, mod we actually had uh, longitudinal data and we were modeling um, uh, does, th so this is not, th oh, those other data are cross-sectional, this is actually longitudinal change. Each line here in this so-called sp spaghetti plot represents a single person observed over different time points. The single dots are just one person or more than one only observed once, but they contribute to um, all of the estimated slope and in general, sure, so there may be, there's a gentle decline, so you can see the average uh, decline here. But if you turn it around, that was modeling by age, from age 70 to age 100. If you turn it around because the majority of the people in this sample we, know, we knew had actually died by the time the study was coming to an end and these analyses were done. So we can turn it around and model distance to death. Um, and this was from um, uh, 15 years out that the, the decline is much sleep, uh, steeper and all I want to do in terms of showing this is that um, the people who are going to be the long-term survivors may well be maintaining their life satisfaction and their evaluation. They're happy to be alive, you know, that can fit, that they've lost all, most of their age peers. But there are other factors that come in uh, at, uh, after age 70 that contribute and in, in particular at a very cl much closer point um, to the very end of life, um, the so-called terminal decline. So just pointing to that, eventually we will be able to do, uh, modelers will be able to do that using um, data from the health and retirement study, but we don't have enough occasions yet to be able to do that. Um, so one thing that is a new development, and um, I mean, various people have been uh, involved in this, and Liz Nielsen has been one of the people who's been encouraging people to um, develop this, is to think about new ways of assessing um, uh, subjective well-being that go beyond just this evaluation, <coughs> and maybe give us a little more insight into what's going on, what's contributing to this evaluation. Of course, the um, some of the previous work that James also mentioned that was derived, uh, developed extensively from this institute was asking about how satisfied not only with your life but with your health, with your family context, with your daily life activities, with your finances, all of those sorts of things. So we have those as well in HRS but how about something else that's getting it like at a daily basis. So this is what we've been trying to do, and we've been trying to find ways to actually get this into a very large uh, national survey, and that isn't easy. So we're still playing around with how do we actually put it in, right? And that's basically what my um, group has been working on for the last few years. So the DRN, that's the Day Reconstruction Method, the original one was on paper. 
So there are many other versions around now that are more telephone measures or in-person measures you can, and, and computer assisted. They produce slightly different things than something where people have to complete it by themselves. I've just pointed out here the different dimensions of difference between, if you know the original Kahneman at, at our um, paper in science. So this was also a paper, it was much longer, it was more detailed. They asked about stop-start episodes, all sorts of things. Um, we tried to do a quick, quick and dirty version, a sort of minimal whatever version. And that was that we, instead of asking people to go through all their day and generate, you know, the, what they did this and then next and ne next and next and next, we said, okay, we want to target particular activities that we think people generally do. Um, and uh, so, and otherwise do somewhat similar uh, sorts of things. So here's an example, here are examples of uh, the questionnaire that um, has now been collected in, in the Health and Retirement Study. This is the version in the 2012 and the 2014, just recently released um, uh, data from, uh, from HRS. You can download the questionnaires. Uh, if you put both ways together, you'll have about 12,000 people over the age of 50 for all those fancy modelers who need lots of data. <laughs> um, there it is, it's cross-sectional, but that's okay. Um, so we asked people to briefly reconstruct yesterday, um, we asked them some general context questions about the day, and then what did you do? How, how long did you watch TV yesterday? Yes or no? How much time did you spend watching TV? Um, and all of those other activities. And then here's just a, the next page, um, looking at that, and then how did you feel? So why you were feel, watching TV, or this is why you were socialising? Um, did you feel happy, interested, frustrated, sad, content, bored, or pain? And we, we were forced to put happy first against my um, good judgment <coughs> because the else <coughs> on the, sorry, <coughs> <coughs> um, in the English Longitudinal Study, which we're harmonized with, and the Office of National Statistics, put happy first. It does tend to color the other judgments, but that's okay. Um, to do cross-national comparisons, it's important. Okay, so we're looking, uh, and of course with these data you could look at each one, you could generate an aggregate variable called positive effect, negative effect, <coughs> effect balance, all the standard sorts of things. But um, you could do a frequency in, um, index, an intensity index, all of these different versions. Um, what we're trying to do is to think about, um, uh, to look at the different response patterns that are there and to develop counts of, um, of when people mention both a negative and a positive. Mm. Now one thing to remember here is that people are reporting an activity that may last for an hour. So they clearly have the opportunity to have experienced many different motions, maybe one only or multiple ones in a different sequence. We do not know what that sequence is. Um, anyway, so I'm going to present uh, data here The HRS has done. You can download the data yourself and play with them. Um, then we had a study we called Robust and just recently, so this is straight, it's like really fresh data, just finished a month ago, the study I mean, um, which we called My Day. <coughs> Michigan day. Anyway, um, and that's the web base. So this is some fancy um, modeling that uh, Rich um, is really responsible for. <laughs> um, where we initially from our um, robust study uh, that we, we tried to model, we asked here the, the start, start, stop times of activities. And so we could actually um, sort of, so these are 50 year old, uh, sorry, this panel is 50 year olds, this panel uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and this was sort of the time sequence across the day of these feelings, if you like, the, the rhythm. But we, we thought also that we can also look at when the majority of the people were reporting these sorts of different activities, and I've just pulled out four here. Um, and of course, the, these feelings are attached to those activities and different age groups, although we haven't plotted it here, of course, doing these activities at different times of the day. So if you really put, get in, 
involved in these data, you could actually look at how the timing of routine activities in a day in your life shape the effective experiences that you have, or the sequence of effective experiences. Okay, but what I'd like to just introduce right now is something that Rich also talked about, and um, this is my attempt to put it into a graphic. So we're currently um, focusing a little bit on, on these mixed emotions. So it's basically, and just using now um, data from the two, 2012 um, HRS, so there were, <coughs> we had six adjectives, and uh, people could remember, could report either just feeling happy, um, <coughs> uh, they could report two, mix, two um, positive, either happy and interested or happy and content or whatever, all those mi possibilities, or they could report all three. And this is not the intensity, this is just <coughs> did you report it or not, just a binary measure. And then on the other side, the same with negatives. So we've got mixtures of positives, mixtures of negatives, discrete um, feelings being reported, but also then whether they reported at least one, um, posi one positive and one negative. Or, but it could be a mi you know, more than one negative or more than one positive along the way. So there are multiple different patterns of responses that might occur. And we call this activity effective complexity. All right, so just now providing you with a quick run through of some results. One of the problems when you have lots of variables is you can always look at different findings, right? So, so who reports mixed experiences? So all these mixed uh, f feelings within an activity. And then what, what's the impact of the day's uh, context? And also, um, does activity make a big difference? So. When you um, turn around and model, as Lindsay Ryan has done for us, the, um, uh, the uh, differences in reporting, or whether the, most of the variance is accounted for by individual differences or activity-related <coughs> differences, the activities that you, you select into, then for the negative, at least, it's the um, activities that really matter. Whereas for the positive um, effect, it's, it's more a sort of trait-like. Um, uh, of individual differences in, in the tendency to be more positive. Okay. All right. <coughs> All right. So, um, whoops, have I gone past here? Okay. So, first of all, age does matter. So, um, the activity uh, effective um, complexity is uh, compared to the 50 uh, year olds, it's reduced. Uh, in all the age groups, and you can, I'll leave you to read that yourself. Um, even though the uh, oldest groups report high global well-being, that's uh, in, in general, then uh, their activity-related effective experiences are both less positive and less negative than people in their 50s. Um, I think that's a, an important finding and something that we should take note of. Personality matters. Um, and just recently we've also been looking at the relationship between um, put the big five traits and which activities you actually report doing in a day. Um, and, and so um, neuroticism and openness, I think, and of course trait um, negative effect um, enhance mixed e the feelings of mixed emotions, but there's a lot of item overlap or content overlap there. But I think the interesting thing is that openness to new experiences, which makes a lot of intuitive sense to me. People who put themselves in, in uh, contexts that are more challenging or more difficult seems to make a difference. Uh, the mixed emotions seem to be reduced by extroversion and <coughs> conscientiousness and trait, higher trait levels of positive effect. And one that, because we have, we always put measures of cognitive ability in, I come from a sort of background where cognitive ability and individual differences in cognitive ability and cognitive aging are very important. Um, so yes, we do find that that's a very interesting thing. So the people who are, have higher levels of cognitive ability are much more likely actually to report mixed emotions. Now this fits together with a different, different theory. Um, of, uh, of aging, which says that um, cognitive complexity is associated with effective complexity. So you're better able 
to put together and I may perhaps even reflect on your feelings. Um, okay, so we've, and, and another one that we found actually, which maybe isn't listed here, is the need for cognition. So this is a measure from John Cassiopo, also predicted not only the activities that you select to do, <coughs> but also the sorts of feelings that you have attached <coughs> to those. Um, so you're putting yourself in more um, challenging context. But health, after age 50, health really starts to matter a lot. And in particular, I haven't mapped it here with um, mixed emotions, but you see the same sort of gradient. So if you <coughs> just average um, feeling happy over cross activities, the more c functional limitations, these are the normal activity, you know, instrumental <coughs> basic activities of daily life, the more that you uh, report, the lower the, your level of happiness over cross activities and the higher the increases in frustration. Again, this makes a lot of intuitive sense if you can't open things, if you can't get yourself carefully out of a chair, of course frustration is going to um, play a role. So proximal context matters, so if you feel tired yesterday, if you felt pain yesterday, or if yesterday was an unusual day because something stressful happened, so this again links to the data from, data from uh, the younger age groups in Midas, um, then of course you, you will be reporting many more um, mixed emotions. And in fact, we also find uh, that if you spend a little, ex or if you report spending more time, then the, the, the likelihood of you reporting uh, different, more negative feelings increases. But not for all activities. It's located on some activities in particular. Um, you can see them there. Okay, so this is just a cumulative plot now. These are from um, HRS in 2012. So <coughs> I'm just uh, reporting now for diff these different activities. Here you see who the, uh, the um, percent of people who said that they did that activity yesterday in this sample. So very few um, report feeling no emotions, but there are some, and that's in particular for health. So that could be that the six uh, affect terms that we had just didn't apply to that. Um, uh, very few report only one feeling. Oh, this is, don't forget, this is self-completed, so that could be a sort of response bias. Very few report a mixture of negative only. Um, quite a percentage, quite a large chunk actually report a mixture of positive only. <coughs> so this means that there has to be two or more um, positive. And, and especially for work and watching TV, but all the other activities as well, you see a group of, a substantial um, subgroup of people who were reporting a mixture of positive and negative. So just in the most recent data, and these are really um, <coughs> uh, very new data, so this really only descriptive at this point. So the My Day, and um, I want to acknowledge here Shannon uh, Mejia, who um, was here yesterday, and uh, Hannah Geisen, who really spent, uh, and also Alex Smith, no relation, who spent a lot of time this summer running this uh, study for us and recruiting 121 people. Thank you very much. Plus two wonderful undergrads who were just fantastic. Um, so these are descriptive data, similar, very similar sort of thing, but now we're trying out a few different activities here. Um, and we put in caring for somebody. You can see the percentage who reported this. And this funny little activity, <coughs> puttering. So does everyone know what puttering means? Yeah, that's good. I see a few nods here. We tried it out on grandparents and parents. It's like maybe what you do on a Saturday morning, you know, it's like you just putter around. You just pick this, look at that, take a cup of coffee, hang out a bit. It's not wasting time, you know, it's just like puttering around, right? Um, and it seems like people p do this. So we had 60%. Of, the, of our participants said, yeah, puttering. I did some puttering around yesterday. Maybe older adults do that quite. So it's, it, it, it's a nice little addition, you know, because anyway, so, um, and again, this is, um, again, the percent of people who just said only positive while there were all these different activities. Uh, and, they re and now Shannon has just pulled out um, the negative, so only one negative. But you can see on everyone that people were mentioning, mentioning some sort of 
uh, negative feeling. It wasn't just all positive. Um, okay, so uh, here's just uh, sort of the, the different mixtures. We haven't really modeled that uh, um, properly yet, but it's just the proportion watching TV who said we tried out indifferent which, rather than just calm. Well, it's 50 50, you know, <coughs> sort of feel, just feeling I couldn't really describe what I'm feeling. Um, and so there are different patterns here which we'll probably get around to modeling at some point. Um, it's a little difficult with only 121 people, but we'll fi find a way. In this one, we put in some appraisals. So we asked people whether you were pre while you were doing this, were you preoccupied? This was an idea that um, Kahneman had in a meeting, and he said, "Well, you know, if you're preoccupied with something else, that's going to color your whole feelings for the whole day. You're worrying about something. You're worried a friend told you know something's happened to a friend, and you're just worried about that, and <coughs> it's just going to color your whole mood. And so we asked people, were you preoccupied or not? And the people, so um, if you were preoccupied, these are the darker colors, then you were more likely to um, report um, a mixture of positive and negative feelings. Um, and then we've, uh, we put in some appraisals. So these are after, um, did you feel exhausted after doing this activity? Did you feel revived? Or did you feel a mixture of being exhausted and revived? So trying to get at, is it the end point? Is it the, your appraisal of you know, the outcome of this activity that's important in coloring your um, reported feelings? And there seems to be something going on here. Um, this is just, uh, um, again, descriptive data. And we really, it's really hot off the press, so we really have to look at, into it further. Um, but it, it seems to. Um, Primarily exhausted seems to play a strong role uh, in terms of um, uh, feeling frustrated in particular, um, perhaps feeling bored, um, and also um, and feeling revived and exhausted, um, which might be after some, uh, I guess, household chores and... Uh, and watching television for some reason or other. I don't know about that one, but anyway. So we're, we're trying to play around with these things and maybe talk, ask people to give us evaluations after the event of what the outcome <coughs> might be. Anyway, just to finish up. So we're starting, we're, we're trying to um, play around with all different sorts of data reduction me um, methods. And um, in part, it's because I also have to write a sort of use a guide for the HRS data and give suggestions to people how they might put these use these data to, and put these data together. Well, an obvious one is just to look at positive effect, negative effect, and effect balance. But it might be nice to suggest to people some other ways of, of um, aggregating across activities. And so we're, we're trying to uh, play around with those, which has been very inventive and creative. And we'd like to get ideas from all of you and from users. Um, but it, it, of course, it depends on which activities are selected. We only target a select few. We're still trying playing around with that. Um, but we think, and it also depends on what um, effect terms you use. We're playing around with those too. We're somewhat limited. We, we, we can use many more in our own studies than we can um, put them into HRS. Health is a very, very important feature. And we also ask about your health on the day. That plays a very different role than your self-rated health in general, the number of illnesses you have, all of those sorts of things. Because people's self-rated health status varies from day to day. We know that too. OK. Um, and here it was higher education. But your cognitive ability matters in terms of um, the extent to which people self-select into more challenging uh, environments and the sorts of things that they have. Um, and also, I'm, I'm starting to think, actually, I started to think this way a little while before. So maybe there's some optimal mixtures in a day of these positive and negative experiences that somehow bring spice to life or variety in life. And all of us need a bit of that. Otherwise, it's pretty boring and monotonous. Right? So all right, I'm going to leave it there. Um, and thank you very much.